Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Books and Books. We are live from Coral Gables, Florida, or as we refer to it here, the cultural heart of the city. My name is Steve. On behalf of everyone here at Books and Books, we are very pleased to have you with us. Please pick one of our uh, Books and Books uh, newsletters. Uh, they're at the counter where the book is being sold this evening. Uh, you can visit our website also and get all the information. This will give you a breakdown of all the great events we have here at the bookstore. Uh, just about every night of the week, we have Spanish events, we have events for kids, poetry readings, uh, first-time authors, and celebrity signings. Uh, the big one we have upcoming is uh, Martin Amos will be here uh, next Sunday, the 26th. We have tickets on sale for that, and of course, all of his books are here in the store. So as I say, there's a, usually an event for everyone's taste, and uh, many of them are now being live streamed through the internet. Uh, you can see our crew over there with the um, the monitors, and I know the cameras are sort of hidden here in the store, but there are a few pointed at the audience, so I will tell you that for the benefit of the people that may be watching on the internet, please make sure you're sitting next to who you're supposed to be sitting next to. I also remind you that uh, flash photography interferes with the live stream, so if you could refrain from that, we'd appreciate it. So again, I encourage you to go to our website. Um, you can get all the information that's going on here at the store. You can even give, it, even give us your email address. We can send you information all the time about everything that comes up here so you don't miss anything. And if you do decide to watch these events through the internet, you can call the store at the number on your screen. Uh, we can get a book signed for you and ship it to you. You can even ask a question of the author while the event is progress. We'll ship the book to you with no charge for shipping anywhere in the U.S. We also ask you to take a look at our beautiful space here at Books and Books. We have live music in the courtyards on Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, this month we are featuring our pop-up bookstore um, uh, in collaboration with Exile Books and Printed Matter. It's on the other side of the store, so if you get a chance, go see that. But we are very pre pleased this evening to welcome back uh, Michael Connors and his beautiful new book, Havana Modern. As a Caribbean design expert, Michael Connors leads the reader on an unprecedented tour of Havana, of the stunning and architecturally important private homes and buildings that have been meticulously preserved, previously unphotographed, and mostly inaccessible to visitors. This lavish book represents the modern movement in Cuban architecture from Art Nouveau and Art Deco to the flowering of the high modernism just before the revolution, spanning from the early 1900s to 1965. At a time when travelers are rediscovering Cuba, this volume offers a range of the city's 20th century cultural achievements. The photographs shot exclusively for this book show examples from the artsy Verdado neighborhood, the seaside streets of Miramar, central Havana, and Havana's posh country, park, country club park area. Included are iconic places such as Cuba's remarkably futuristic National Schools of Art, the Art Deco landmark Bacardi Building, and the Hotel Nacional de Cuba, designed by McKim, Mead, and White. On Havana's seaside drive the Malacan and the world's famous, world famous Tropicana nightclub by architect Max Borges. Havana Modern is a pioneering book of modern design that shows a corner of the world where modern architecture thrived and has been carefully preserved. Mike Connors has more than 30 years of experience in writing, consultation, and teaching in fine and decorative arts. He has authored many books, including The Splendor of Cuba, French Island Elegance, and Cuban Elegance. We're pleased to have him with us. Please welcome Michael Connors. Thank you, Steve. I um, am not allowed to use a microphone because I speak too loud. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. As I suspected. I want to first uh, thank Steve, of course, for that nice introduction. And I also want to thank the owner of the bookstore, Mitch Kaplan. Thank you, Mitch. Woo. I'm also grateful to the Graceland Memorial Foundation for uh, subsidizing and sponsoring this event. This is not Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee, where Elvis used to live, but it is here in uh, Miami. Um, what I'm <laughs> what I want to do today, <clears throat> if you want to know who owns these houses or who owned these houses that I'm going to be showing you and or who lives in them now, you'll have to get the book. Today, it's not important for me to name names and give you dates. What I want to do today is to take you on a visual tour of Havana from 1902 till 19, Steve said 65, but I'm going to go a little bit further than that. I'm actually going to go to the 1970s. So, as we know, there were three wars going on, had been going on, Cuban Wars of Independence. And the Americans came in at the last minute under the auspices of the state of Maine being 
uh, blown up in Havana Harbor, uh, snatched the victory from the Cubans, and renamed the war the Spanish-American War. When, the, when America sat down at the table with Spain, the Cubans were not invited. Be that as it may, after three years of occupation, the Americans did bring in a lot of money and a lot of engineers and a lot of architects and redid the infrastructure of Havana and all of Cuba. So this is when my examination of Havana begins. During that first um, intervention and occupation. So what we're going to be talking about is the Beaux-Arts architecture that was popular during that time. I'll try not to be too professorial and if in fact you're bored with what I'm talking about or I'm becoming too uh, academic, just pretend like you're nodding <laughs> and I will then take up from there and, and move along a little faster. All right, so people ask me why I ended up in Cuba 15 years ago. I was doing a book, my first book, called Caribbean Elegance. And of course, there were five countries that colonized the West Indies. England, Spain, Denmark, Holland, and France. To do the Spanish chapter, I felt I had to go to Cuba. In other words, I went to Cuba by default. I had no intention of enjoying it or, uh, or uh, having fun or any of that. As soon as I landed in Cuba, my whole perception of Cuba changed. People ask me, what is it that you most like about Cuba? Well, I certainly like the music. I like the rum. I like the cigars. But what I like most are the people. The Cuban people are different. And I've, I've been to every island in the Caribbean, either sailed in or flown in. And the Cuban people are different. They're generous, they're hospitable, they're industrious, and they're resourceful. And these things are what brings me back to Cuba. I've done four books in Cuba. This is my fourth. And I'm doing a fifth one. Um, on, the world, on UNESCO's World Heritage Sites, nine of the 26 World Heritage Sites in the Caribbean Basin, nine of them are in Cuba. So I've got another excuse to go back. But the people of Cuba is what brings me back. And it's the people in Cuba today that you may not believe me because I'm here in Miami. I'm not in New York City where everybody agreed with me. But Cuba is changing. I don't, I don't know when you were last there, but Cuba is changing. In the 15 years that I've been there, I've seen changes. Not all of them are good, but I've seen changes. All right, so here we go. Let's get started on this. That's not my fault, folks. I'm standing still. This is, a sec this is the second floor of Capitanes Generales. And this is what old Cuba in the 19th century the 1800s. That's the way folks lived and or wanted to live. This was their expectations. Everything was open. The doors and the windows on the outside were open to facilitate airflow, inner courtyard. But, but as soon as the revolution, or excuse me, the war of independence was over and with American intervention, things changed. Living in the old city became passé. Nobody wanted to live in the old world. The, uh, a independence had happened, and it was time to change. So that change took place, and people started moving out into the suburbs. Um, and one of the most popular was Verdado. Now, in Verdado, and I'll take you up now to 1959, when the regime came in, and started expropriating houses that where people lived. If you continued to live in your house, if you stayed in your house, you could keep your house. This is a house, the lady still lives here. 
She's in her 90, uh, she's in her 90s, and she has not left this house since the 1920s. I've got oh a dozen photographs in there that um, uh, let me uh, first introduce you to because my principal photographer Nestro Marti just came up from Havana. He lives in Havana. He and his wife just arrived and is standing here in the back. Nestro, will you stand up, please? So he came up especially to be with you tonight. And uh, I might add that these are his photographers, taken, or photographs taken from the book. And they are, I think he brought 10 or 12 with him. He has sold about half of them. These five he's just brought in. These five are for, for sale. So we'll talk about that afterwards. We're also going to have a question and answer period afterwards, too. So I see a young woman raising her hand over there wanting to uh, ask a question. I'll be happy to answer a question. So this is the Beaux Arts architecture that was popular at the turn of the 20th century. Beaux Arts, we know all about that. And if you don't, read the book. The inside of this house is amazing because um, J Josie has kept the furniture that was there from the 1920s, has kept everything there from the 1920s. Now, I'm only going to show you two of these photos, but there are, there are more than a dozen in the book of, of each room that she has. And this is, these, this is the kind of life that was going on continually from 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s until the revolution and the, the most recent revolution, 1959. She's um, a very smart lady and I feel honored to have sat down and had tea with her more than once. Also, during the first decades of the, of the uh, 20th century, the 1900s. After the Spanish American, and I have a hard time calling it that, but because of this Roosevelt series that has just been on TV, I don't know how many of you have seen that, but they're calling it questions afterwards. <laughs> uh, uh, it will give you an idea that uh, the, the Spaniards that were defeated then uh, Spain had a lot of business interests still in Cuba. So that business interest, they wanted to keep that, that commerce going. So there was an influx of Spanish immigration in the first decade of the 20th century. And these Spaniards came from different parts of Spain. And the different uh, provinces of Spain built their own, um, let's call them country clubs, or centers. And this is one of them. And this one I like because of the staircase and the stained glass window. The stained glass window above the staircase, Beaux Arts architecture, is as big as books in books. So you can imagine how large this staircase is, all marble, imported marble in one thing or another. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs of Nestro's, and I think it took him oh, uh, probably anywhere from 20 to 30 shots to get it perfect. This is what he's good at. And you'll see more of the of instances of this, but he, he composed it perfectly. The moon wasn't always there. It was higher, it was lower, but he got it right. What, what is, uh, I want to point out here is that Beaux-Arts architecture, again, the capital is very reminiscent of our capital in the U.S., but if you visit Havana, which I'm sure all of you will at one point or another, um, you, will, you will see that the Cubans are very proud about saying and bragging that their capital is three, me three meters larger than the capital in the U.S., <laughs> which in fact is true. We're now at 1916, and this was the first house that was built. Uh, by a sugar baron that had an indoor pool. When I was doing my research here, I found out uh, letters back and forth where they would put wooden planks over the pool for dancing at night. This was built in 1916, 
and it was the first uh, indoor pool in Havana. It's in Verdado, and today it is uh, the it houses the British ambassador's residence. Another beautiful uh, palacio. This was one family's home. You have to keep that in mind. This was not a um, a center for Spanish um, a club. This was one family's home, although today it is the Spanish Embassy. And if you look closely, you'll see the, that the Beaux Arts um, architecture. But if you look even more closely, you'll see that Art Nouveau influx, the curvilinear line. Keep in mind that every style of architecture Am I doing the wrong one here, I guess? I beg your pardon. You get a second view. Every, every um, style or period of architecture is either uh, an embellishment upon the previous style. You know, there are seats down here. There are like plenty of seats in here. You can sit down. Especially on those high heels. That's got to be hard on those feet. Um, well, there are plenty of seats over there too. Um, there are every style in architecture, not just architecture, but fine art, is either a, an embellishment upon the preceding style or a reaction against it. So here we have the Beaux Arts style, which is very reminiscent of the of French and Spanish Renaissance and, and classicism. And a reaction against that would be the curvilinear line of the Art Nouveau. So just to emphasize, and I see somebody nodding, which means I'm becoming a little too professorial again. <laughs> you look at the five style, you look at the styles in Cuba. This only happens in Havana. Only in Havana. Every architectural style that has existed in the last 500 years in the Western Hemisphere not not counting uh, what's in Asia, but in the Western Hemisphere, every style that has existed is in Havana. You've got the uh, uh, Renaissance, uh, you've got uh, Romanesque, Renaissance, Gothic, Baroque, Rococo, Neoclassicism, the, uh, the Beaux-Arts, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Modernism, the Streamline Modernism, uh, the International Style. So it's all there. You cannot say that is true in any other city in this hemisphere. Not New York, not Mexico City, not Boston, not Philadelphia, only in Havana. That alone distinguishes that city, um, well, beyond any other city that's in this hemisphere. Why do I keep doing that? So here we have that Art Nouveau undulating curvilinear line. And this is what happened when the Spanish immigrants were coming in during the first and second decade of the 20th century. They were coming from Barcelona, from Madrid, and they brought this new modern or new art style with them, and they brought it to Cuba. So you have this, uh, this wonderful, and there are buildings all throughout Cuba. Remember, Cuba uh, is an island 750 miles long. It's a big, it's not only the biggest island in the, in the Caribbean, but it is a very large uh, land span. So it takes, it takes a while. We have this Art Nouveau all through uh, Cuba. But Havana, of course, is the, is the center of that. And everywhere we go in Havana, we see, we see Art Nouveau. This interior, for example, it went even into the furniture, that curvilinear undulating line. Any street you go by. We found this accidentally, just going down a street, going between and, uh, uh, Nestro's driver, a fellow by the name of T.T., uh, was it? Uh, that's the one we were walking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. I was just trying to get a plug in for the driver. Forget it. <laughs> anyway, we found this just accidentally. And uh, so you can see that we have this Art Nouveau wherever we go in, in uh, Havana. 
Now, after the Art, Deco, after the Art Nouveau, is a reaction against the curvilinear undulating line is the straight geometric line. We have the Art Deco. And people say, well, you know, you, you folks are photoshopping here with that green car in front of that green house. It's the same green. And that's not true. And Nestro is here to, uh, to validate this. Uh, now, there were many shots taken before the green car. But finally, this green car comes by, and we get this shot. <laughs> now, the other shot that you see on the left, that's, a, a, that's the only shot I put in there of this beautiful Palacio, and is, which is now the uh, Museum of Decorative Arts. And that's the floor. But the reason I put it in there is to, to accentuate and tell you the wealth that was going on at Cuba at the time. This fellow that built this house brought in sand from the Nile River to use as grout, to mix with the grout, to mix the, uh, to mix the tile with. And there are more, there are more pictures in, um, in the book of that, of that particular home. The, um, Hotel Nacional, made famous by uh, many things, uh, Clark Gable, uh, but then again, there was the Godfather too. And in, and in fact, in 1940, this hotel was built in 1930, started in, uh, started in 28, uh, completed in 1930. And it looks very much like the Breakers or sort of Palm Beach type of Florida Beaux-Arts. But then again, if you look close, which I can't focus this in at the top, it's got wonderful Art Deco elements to it. And uh, made famous by the meeting of the, um, the uh, U.S. Uh, Mafia and the Italian Cosa Natra in 1946. But the, the Gallery of Rogues, the bar that's at the end of the, um, of the lobby, you can see all of the famous people that, that uh, lived here or that stayed here. This was an interesting shot. Uh, Nestro did not like to uh, my... Uh, suggestion that we end up there at 4.30 in the morning, but it was the only time we could do this shot because there were no people in the hotel lobby. This is the original lobby from 1930, and if one was to turn around, there's just as much space behind us as we are here. All original Cuban mahogany, sweet tinea mahogany, and um, a Spanish tile. The only thing different is that they are now using energy-saving light bulbs, those white light bulbs instead of uh, condescent light bulbs. Everything else is original. I call it preservation by neglect. <laughs> My favorite Art Deco building in Cuba, of course, is the Bacardi building. And, and the Bacardi, this was the center of the Bacardi rum empire. And it uh, is truly amazing. You, saw, you notice the uh, bat which is now the trademark of the Bacardi rum. And it was uh, not necessarily Bacardi's. It was and might still be a symbol of good luck in Cuba. So it is uh, that bronze bat at the top. We have far more um, uh, pictures in the book. Oh, I'd forgotten this was here. This was interesting. Uh, Mr. Marti laid on the floor and pointed the camera towards the original mirror on the wall and was able to capture all of the ceiling of the interior of the lobby. This is, there are four, three different interiors. This is one of them. Not, we didn't do just uh, civic buildings and or houses, but we also did churches. We did, um, we did as much uh, we tried to cover the, the area as much, and I'm sure that some of you, as some of my Cuban friends are here today, so I know they recognize this in Iglesia Santa Rita, the Church of Santa Rita, Saint Rita in uh, Verdado. And this is where you first start seeing that reinforced concrete being used in, in architecture. Another one of my Art Deco favorite buildings here is, uh, and notice the Moroccan red uh, uh, marble and the black granite and how there are two shots here, one on the left and uh, a closer one on the right. 
how it draws you into the lobby of this building. The, you, what you have is a staircase on the left uh, in these shots and an elevator on the right. And then between them, a very artistic uh, adaptation called El Tempo, which is the time. And if you look closely, you can see three airplanes and a figure, a running figure, that, uh, and a clock above, although the hands on the clock are missing. I don't know what happened to those, but this is a close-up of it. And it supposedly depicts how much time was passing, how fast time was passing. This is in the 1930s now. You have to remember that this new innovation was hitting Cuba. Plenty of money down there, and there was plenty of, uh, of building, and everybody wanted to build in the new style. The artist that did that, this was his house. And he also did, if you look closely at the facade of the house, he also did those relief sculptures that you see. Uh, we have many interior shots of this house. Um, Enrique Garcia, uh, in, he also um, uh, did illustrations for the uh, magazine Social. Uh, Okay, so Steve, we're going to need your help on that one. So um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is to bring you chronologically through the beginning with the, uh, art, with the uh, Beaux-Arts to the Art Nouveau. We're at the Art Deco now. Now this Art Deco, what it turns into is a streamlined modernism. These straight geometric lines become more curvilinear, more like what you see uh, on, um, on the um, steamships in the Normandy and such. So, um, am I going too fast, too slow? Gloriana, you're late. <laughs> Where's Mimi? Okay. Thank you. Is this not amazing? Talk about preservation by neglect or preservation by conservation. This is the interior, one, one shot. I think Nestro did, oh, maybe a dozen shots of the interior of this American theater, right in central Havana. And this was the ladies' cloak room. We did not do anything to make this shot except move two chairs. Everything is as it was in the 1930s. And they're still using the theater. So people say, so it's like walking back into a time capsule? Yes, but you can pick your time capsule. You can go back 450 years to the colonial era. You can go back to the 1950s. You can go back uh, in any, any time period between that. Uh, the inside of the theater, of course, is exactly the same as it was when it was built in the, in the mid-30s, uh, late 30s. And it's uh, obviously done uh, with a, uh, a seashell in mind. The interior looks like the inside of a seashell. Uh, not all theaters are as preserved as well as the American theater. This was one where we used to have our, um, our lunch next door. At, was that chicken not good, Nestro? <laughs> it was great. And unfortunately, we weren't there long enough to see a yellow car go by. But you can see the Art Deco feeling that is here. And the, the, um, the, the, what is going on is, if any of you have ever seen my previous book, The Splendor of Cuba, we did a big expose on the, Havana, the uh, Cathedral of Havana, that curvilinear facade there. Well, here it is again, but in an Art Deco st uh, st uh, style. One of my favorite houses, and I'm going to go ahead and then come back. Notice the front of the house here with the three 
uh, windows, the linear windows there. Now look at this slide. Those three windows, now I'll go back. Those three windows, this is the outside of the house. And this was a private home, of course, built in the early 40s. So we're up to the 40s now. And when we went inside, we saw this interior. This is two shots now. The left is uh, standing uh, outside the staircase and looking out outside the window through the staircase. The, the shot on the right is standing below and taking the camera up and looking up the staircase. And it gives you that wonderful abstract feeling that these architects, the streamline modern, how these, this art deco was turning into a sort of a curvilinear line again, streamline. Now, another thing about architects, some of the best architects in the world were visiting Cuba. Philip Johnson was there. Uh, Richard uh, Notre was there. And we'll talk more about them later if you don't fall asleep before I'm finished here. But today, if you're an architect in Cuba, you're not allowed to have your own business. And we can talk more about that later, too. Um, Casa de uh, las Americas. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is the wonderful late Art Deco feeling that it has there, that modernism. Um, there's still seats here. Everybody's like crowded at the door. We have so many seats in here. Um, and the reason I'm showing it to you is because this book is being presented in Cuba in two weeks at Casa de las Americas. So I'm a North American. I don't have, I'm not Cuban. I'm Irish. Can you tell? <laughs> All right. So... To, for them to invite me down and to present this book, a North American down, invent a North American book, and present it in Cuba, that in itself is a change. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know what it means, but uh, I try not to know too much down there. One, uh, um, this is a wonderful theater, Theater Faustus on the Prado. Just absolutely a beautiful theater, and still in existence, and still... Uh, performances being and, and just restored as a matter of fact another wonderful apartment building um, that I did feature in my last book but only uh, a small part of it and the architect uh, the 1941 1942 where we're talking about uh, be patient with me we're almost finished another 20 years um, <laughs> it was to to uh, reminiscent of the waves it was built on the Malacan which is right overlooking the ocean. So this architect wanted people to be able to walk out on their balconies in the 1940s and, and think that this was reminiscent of the ocean. Many of these homes, these private homes, we were able to not only photograph the outside that were built in the 1940s and 1950s. A lot of modest, more modest homes were built in the 50s. The... Uh, Hotel Riviera is kind of an interesting uh, story I have. A friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Ricardo Porro, who's 86 years old. He's Cuban. He lives in Paris with his wife, Elena. And he um, was the lead architect for the schools. We'll talk about them a little bit later. He was at a meeting with Meyer Lansky. This hotel was built by the gangster, Meyer Lansky and uh, a meeting with Philip Johnson and Meyer Lansky. Ricardo Porro invited Wilfredo Lam to be in that meeting. Meyer Lansky, I'm giving the shorthand version of this story because people are starting to leave. Um, Meyer Lansky said to Wilfredo Lam, I want you to, he was going to paint the mural uh, going from the lobby to the casino. I want you to uh, paint Two huge dice on that mural. Well, at that point, Philip Johnson stood up and said, Mr. Meyer, don't be so crude. <laughs> well, at that point, Meyer Lansky, or Mr. Meyer, Mr. Lansky, uh, Meyer Lansky fired Philip Johnson, fired Ricardo Porro, and fired Wilfredo Lam. And he got a Miami architect to do his hotel for him. This is the back side of the hotel. 
uh, with the pool. Esther Williams swam there and performed there. There are 75 private cabanas that encircle the pool, and each one of them has a private telephone. So you can imagine when Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner and that those people were staying at this hotel in 1956, 1957, how luxurious it was. Nothing has changed. Unfortunately, we went into one of the rooms to get a shot, and I mean the mold and everything was, but they haven't changed anything. You got to keep in mind, there are no McDonald's down there, no strip malls, no Dunkin' Donuts. So, <laughs> preservation by neglect. The restaurant, look at this. We went in here to take this shot of the restaurant. I turned over a plate, the same uh, flatware and the same china is being used today. The food is terrible. <laughs> I mean, if any of you have been to Cuba or you're going to go, don't eat at the government restaurants. Eat at the Paladars. That's, uh, but, and the food at the Paladars is unbelievable. La Guarita and Casa de Lilian, etc. But this, unfortunately, is a government restaurant. It's n no one ever eats there. But that might be a good thing because the plates are the same plates that were being served in 1956. I have a feeling the napkins are the same too. The only thing different are the light bulbs. Again, they've put the energy saving light. So that white light that you get is um, another hotel. Uh, this was the uh, uh, Conrad Hilton's hotel. The, uh, Havana Hilton uh, and it wasn't open even a year before um, Fidel Castro and his troops came in commandeered the hotel they moved everybody out they moved in and stayed for seven months and this was command central and renamed the hotel uh, Habana Libra interior of the Habana Libra I keep calling it the Hilton I, I've got to learn not to do that when I'm down there um, wonderful architecture though and and in the book I go into detail as to what all this is I don't want to bore you with it now Max Borges jr. what an unbelievable Cuban architect this was the house he lived in this this was the architecture that he did for himself it's still there beautiful and of course he was also the architect of the Tropicana Cabaret which is still going on today how they've managed to keep it open and do it, I don't know, but at least a thousand people show up and mostly Canadian, uh, German, and European tourists are there, but uh, every night the same, the same deal goes on. And, whoops, I don't know how that got in there. Nestro must have put that one in there. But this is a great shot. We were told we were not allowed in the, in, to take pictures. Then they said, okay, you can take pictures. Then we said, well, we want to do it during the daytime, too. Oh, no, can't do that. But long story short, we were able to do that. And these are the, uh, the chorus girls going through a new number. And notice the, uh, the green sort of sculpture that you see off to the left. That was Max Borges Jr.'s sculpture. And at night, it lights up. So when the chorus girls are dropping out of the trees at night, and this... And this sculpture is lighting up and blinking in one thing or another. It's sort of an amazing uh, uh, experience. Well, not sort of. It is an amazing experience. Another wonderful building. We're in the 50s now, obviously, so we're almost finished. Bear with me another couple of minutes. And this building was the tallest. Uh, over 600 luxurious apartments were built in this building. The tallest building in Latin America. And it was, in its day, the, not just the tallest, but the most luxurious building in all of Latin America. There are literally thousands of these mid-century, meaning 1950s houses, all through Cuba. I only brought in uh, Havana houses. This one has been turned into a, a paladar called Vista Mar. It's one of my favorite places to eat fresh fish. And that is, um, uh, you see, it's right on the ocean, right on the water. So that 
it's built on these stilts, which was Le Corbusier was famous for doing that. So when you, when you see through it, this is where you would park the car where you're sitting now. And then that is a reflection on the left. And you walk in that glass and walk upstairs. But if, and then you can walk through and, of course, see the, see the saltwater pool. And when the ocean is rough, this is the Straits of Florida, it flows over into the pool there. So you see the pool again? You get the idea that uh, these were this was very innovative architecture that was going on. And one of, the, one of the finest innovators, one of my favorites, is Ricardo Porro. This was a very small, modest house that he did for someone. And um, we were uh, invited in and not only were able to photograph the outside, but were able to, I mean, how often do you see that? You see examples of this in Coral Gables, and, but when someone buys a house like this, I've seen over in Naples, that the first thing they do is try and buy the second lot, tear everything down, and then build these humongous houses to the lot line that are, look like something out of California. The preservation that's going on of these places, look at the interior of this. All of the, in, all of the interior, with the exception of art, everybody tries to bring in young Cuban artists and uh, tries to sponsor them. So everything is period, meaning mid-1950s, uh, uh, mid mid-century, with the exception of the art. And the art is always young Cuban artists that they, they exhibit. Uh, Ricardo Porro again, you know uh, the story of the uh, uh, School of Fine Arts or the School of Arts out in the country club area. If you don't, I suggest you get the book. This is, there were five schools, drama, ballet, modern dance, fine arts or plastic arts, and um, da, 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 music. Only two of the schools were completed. It started in 1961 and they shut them down with the help of the Soviets in 1965. And that's when uh, Ricardo Porro left Cuba in 1966. So, um, but two of the schools are still functioning. This is the School of Modern Dance and the School of Fine Arts. This is the entrance to the School of Fine Arts. The interior, one of the interior courtyards one of the interior studios, my friend Miguel doing his paintings there. He's graduating this year. And also, my friends, the triplets of our, meaning uh, Fundacion Amistad's liaison. Their mother is a woman by the name of Martika. And uh, she had three boys. She lived in Trinidad. She had three boys on Christmas Day. Totally amazing. They are now 12 years old, and they are all in the uh, Cuban School of Ballet. They excel, and there was just a documentary made on them called Dance Like a Man. It's an amazing documentary. I suggest you, you uh, look at it. If you, and this is the interior of Ricardo Porro's modern dance studio, one of the seven that are there. It's amazing that you, uh, you, anywhere you go in Havana, there's reminiscent of some period or another. And it's no, it's no wonder that in the 1950s, uh, you'll see a 1950s gas station, but you'll see a 1950s car in front of it always, too. Uh, ending this thing up now, uh, I mentioned earlier that there were very famous, world-famous architects in Cuba over the period of this, this 60 years that I cover in this book, uh, Modern Havana or Havana Modern, one of them being Richard Notra. This is the Notra House in uh, the Country Club area, or Cubanacana. And you see here his spider leg arcade, which is, he was so famous for, for the entrance. And again, I wish I could show you all the pictures, but uh, in the book there are over 230 photographs, so you'll enjoy You'll enjoy looking at it. But what Notro tried to do was to bring the outside in and bring your living on the inside out. So with that, there was a lot of glass, very, little, very few structures. So we've gone, a, we've gone a long way 
from that Beaux-Arts uh, house of Josie's that I showed you in the beginning that was built in the first decade of the 20th century to this house that was built in the late 1950s. And uh, Max Boris Jr. again, this was a swim club uh, out at the, um, uh, I, I know that one of my Cuban friends, this was your club, right? Yes, with Nazi there you go. So many people uh, here in this room probably spent time there. So what I want to do is to thank you for your attention, thank you for your patience of going through this, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, I went over time, so uh, yes, sir. So uh, you mentioned the phrase preservation by the neglect quite a bit. Um, aren't there a lot of buildings, though, that, that might have been equally fabulous, but that fell down or got, or just there were have been because they were neglected? Absolutely. And I would say maybe even the majority of them. There have been wonderful photographers come to Cuba. Uh, um, uh, Andrew, uh, Michael Eastman, Andrew Moore, Robert Palladori, they've all done beautiful photography there, but all of their photography is the buildings that are falling down, children with no shoes on, laundry in the courtyard. I've seen that. I don't want to see it anymore. I want to see a part of Cuba that's beautiful, and there still is a part of Cuba that's beautiful. There's, it's still there. You have to look for it. And you have, to, you have to sort of elbow your way in sometimes. But it's still there. And the reason we do these, these books is so that we can continue to pressure the people that are down there. And there are plenty of architects and conservators and preservationists that are trying to, uh, to preserve not just the colonial buildings, but the, but the 20th century ones too. They're just as important. It's the, it's the Cuban patrimony. So, so these survived, most of these survived, simply because we're fortunate. I mean, not because there was any great effort. No, that's in any not case. true. There, some of these that I've showed you, people have taken, I mean, the, the Ricardo Porro houses, they took great pains. A fellow told me he took five years to restore that house. Um, the, the, uh, there's a, a film, a documentary called um, Unfinished Spaces, uh, uh, that is very important film about the restoration, conservation, and preservation of the schools of art. John Loomis has wrote a book called um, uh, Revolution of Forms uh, on that same subject. So, and there are preservationists down there. My friend Jose Antonio Choi, who is an architect, although he's not allowed to have his own business, he is constantly uh, uh, aware of the preservation that is needed. Eduardo Luis Rodriguez is his name. He's also uh, an advocate for preservation of 20th century architecture. So they're, they're there, they live there. Uh, but, yes? In 2012, there was an article uh, in the paper that uh, Carlos Acosta the ballet dancer, along with Norman Foster, right. trying to finish the National Schools of the Art. And there was a big argument. Uh, Still going on. The original Norman architect. Foster, the English architect, <laughs> Correct. and uh, Acosta, the uh, ballet dancer with the Royal Ballet in London, wanted, who is Cuban, wanted to get together and do the restoration of the ballet school at the F School of Fine Arts. Well, as anybody knows that either is Cuban and or has been to Cuba, it's muy complicado. Everything is complicated down there. Really complicated. So there's still that, that trying to go on. What's the latest on that from 2012 when I read that to today? Do you have any news? Nothing's happened, Two years? but they're still talking. <laughs> there's a discussion. Listen. There's been a discussion going on about the U.S. embargo and the travel ban for 53 years. Let's go another 53, or let's not. Yes? Yes. Do you have any idea of what, uh, what plans, if, if any, there are uh, to 
of, of once once a, a major change comes about in Cuba uh, to, to avoid the strip malls and the McDonald's and I don't know about that. And not all of that, all of those changes are going to come from the Cuban people. I don't think it's going to come from the from the U.S. at all. I don't think it's going to even come from the Cuban politicians or our government or military. I think it's going to come from. That's just my opinion. And when I'm there, I don't talk politics. And when I'm here, I don't talk politics. So that I have permission from the U.S. government to go down, and I have permission from the Cuban government to do my work there. So I'm I'm not I'm not uh, qualified to answer that question. Other than I think it's going to be the Cuban people that make the changes. Well, that that's kind of scary because a lot of people in Cuba, this is the sense I get from from newer arrivals, uh, they're so tired of of, of the uh, the buildings that are falling apart that they just want to raise everything and just have. Uh, that's no different new though. Building. Uh, Sarek was an architect that came down in the 50s. He wanted to tear everything down on the Malacan and build an island out into the Straits of Florida and put sort of like a Singapore thing happening. You know, so that's nothing new. There are always going to be those people that want to tear everything down and there are always going to be the people that want to preserve everything. There's, always, there's got to be a balance between the two. Whether that balance happens or not, that's, that's the question you're asking. And that's the question I don't know. And I'm hoping the, the Cuban people, generally speaking, know that this is their patrimony. They know that this is important, not just the colonial, but the, the mid-century. They know this, and they value it. So that's why I say it's the Cubans that are going to be the ones that decide. Yes? Mr. Connors, on behalf of the Cubans here, at least the ones in this row, we thank you so much for bringing Cuba to us through all this, the different set of decades of architecture as well as Mr. Monti, a brilliant photographer. And I wanted to make a comment about, I noticed that in most of the houses, the vehicles in front match the color of the house. <laughs> I want you to know that my family did the same thing. They were able to get some paint from another province. Ah. I got to Cuba to visit them. The car was aqua, the house was aqua, and there was a little paint left, and they did the refrigerator, too. <laughs> so, it's not a coincidence, it's really true happens. If they get paint, they will paint. We love that. Yes. And the ne one of the next books I want to do is, I want to start getting into the Heatherlands of Cuba, and I want to start taking pictures of uh, interiors, I mean, of artists, in, I, there's an artist house in Camaway that I just can't wait to get into the world of interiors, Shelter Magazine. I mean, I know some places in Cuba you would not believe. And I've got to get there, and I've got to capture it before it's gone, and put it in another book. But thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Do, do you have a fear, um, you, you had a good question, but expanding on that, do you have a fear that, that um, it will change, though, that a lot of the old things, um, the, the old architecture, the old ways of doing things, will change radically once the bearded one is gone and once all that changes and the real investment comes and it could turn into Miami Beach. I mean, it could. Know? Hey, I'm, you're, you're absolutely correct. And, but there are people like Xavier Leal who has pretty much restored Havana, old, the old Havana. But then again, when I go down there now, I'm a little, I'm a little put off now because now, I mean, I loved it five, six years ago, but now it's turned into kind of a Disneyland type of feeling. So you can, you, there, there's, and, and if Xavier was standing right here, I'd say the same thing because I think he'd agree with me. But um, you have, there's a balance. You have to be careful. And the, but there's the point. My point is there's so much there, so let's do what we can to preserve what we can, the best way we can. I mean the Art Nouveau, that's there. The Art Deco that's there. Not just the 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 40s and 50s stuff, but even uh, the train station, the custom station, the all of that is it needs to be uh, preserved. No more questions. Thank you very much.
for those of you that want to go to Cuba, uh, we have a, a, a sheet here with Fundación Amistad. We take people down on architectural tours. Also, I'm going to be signing books over there if you want to uh, Thank buy you. a book. Yeah. Books are for sale at the counter, folks. Mike will be sitting right over here to sign it for you. You're watching online, give us a call. We'll get one signed for you. Thank you. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 